the story of Greece should not really matter for the rest of the world. Greece is too small. It should matter for us Greeks. But it shouldn't really matter to you in Sweden, to the Brits, to the Americans. But it's, Greece is a little bit like the canary in the mine. It died in order to warn the rest, the miners down the mine, that there was a systemic problem, a methane leak, let's say. Uh, and the way in which the powers that be, the liberal establishment, which is now protesting Donald Trump and Brexit and Le Pen and so on, mishandled, massively mishandled the Greek crisis, is indicative of the way in which the liberal establishment has lost the plot internationally after 2008. So the reason why it is in English and why I exerted so much effort in putting it together and not just publishing a Greek book in Greece about our um, country's problems is because I think that it's, it's a universal story. And it's also a kind of drama because very often I, I caught myself in meetings with very powerful people who were caught up in a trap of their own making in a way that only Shakespeare can relate. The title Adults in the Room, that comes from Christine Lagarde, head of yes, the At some point she, she said that we need adults in the room in order to have a, uh, an agreement. But it's an expression that she did not invent. It's an expression that, uh, in a sense, relates and reflects the contempt that the establishment has for the people. They refer to themselves as adults. And of course the children are the masses out there who supposedly are the, uh, the source of all legitimacy in a f properly functioning democracy. So Sweden hasn't joined the Euro. We had a referendum in 2003. Thankfully. Sweden. Did we have a lucky escape? Absolutely. Why? This is, the, the architectural flaws is the reason why you should not have been, been part of it, and we shouldn't have been part of it either. The Greek bailout was nothing more than a bailout for Deutsche Bank, Finance Bank, BNP Paribas, Société Générale, the French and German banks. Between them they had lent 200 billion to the Greek state. They were already insolvent because they had stuffed their boots with toxic derivatives from the other side of the Atlantic. And they had already been bailed out by the French and particularly uh, the German government, and Mrs. Merkel could not go back to the Bundestag and demand another wad of money for the same banks that she had just saved. So it was packaged as an act of solidarity towards the lazy Greeks, which of course has to be, uh, to come attached with austerity strings, you know, tough love. In reality, this was money that went from the German, Slovak, Portuguese, Irish taxpayer to the Greek state to go straight back to the French and German banks on conditions that guaranteed to shrink the incomes of the Greeks that were not enough to pay for the old debts, let alone for the new ones. Mm. A ten-year-old can tell you that this cannot end well. Because in the book, you're, you're, you're very critical of this, obviously, but you also express understanding for why Dominic Strauss-Kahn, Christine Lagarde, even Mrs. Merkel do this at the first instance. Understanding is not the same thing as excuse. No. Or legitimacy. I believe that whenever you talk to someone, whenever you try to negotiate with someone, uh, you should try to see things from their perspective. It does not mean that you agree with them, it does not mean that you excuse what they do, but that unless you have this capacity to get into the shoes of the other person, then you, you are not going to have a civilized discussion. My discussions with Christine, with um, all these people, were very civilized. The trouble was that they did not have the political degrees of freedom uh, to, to come clean about what they had done, because they, they had uh, affected the crime against logic. Lending the largest amount of money in the history of capitalism, in absolute terms, not relative terms, to the most bankrupt state in Europe, was a crime against logic, especially when they did it under conditions of such harsh austerity that guaranteed the diminution of the incomes from which those loans... Now, of course, they didn't expect to get their money back. And, but they could not bring themselves and to telling... And they didn't want their money back. You well, they wanted their money back, but they wanted other things more than, than, right. than the money. They wanted to preserve and maintain their own power structure. Uh, in particular, in our case, given that we opposed them, we got elected on a campaign to restructure the debt when they didn't want to restructure the debt. Uh, if they had come to an accommodation with us, a compromise, a mutual compromise, find common, common ground, a mutually advantageous agreement, uh, they would have gotten more money back than they are getting now. But uh, Spani Spanish voters, Irish voters, Portuguese voters, Italian voters, and ultimately French voters might 
have gotten ideas in their heads that they, they could have opposed Lagarde, Merkel, Schäuble, Hollande, and so on and so forth, and achieve a better outcome. From the perspective of those who were you know, in power at the time, this was a nightmare, mm -hmm. and it had to be snuffed out. Shouldn't you somehow have been more aware of the political reality? I mean, were there any political conditions where sort of Germany could forgive Greece's debt? Allow me to say that not for one second did I believe that the power of reason and persuasion would prevail. Not for one second. But you still kept going in there for five months? Of course I kept going there and, and one has to speak the language of reason. So you knew you were going to lose? No. I knew that we would lose if we didn't have a deterrent. You need two things. You need sensible proposals and a deterrent when they try to crush you. And your deterrent was Greece leaving? No, not in the slightest. Firstly, the Greek state still owed 27 billion to the European Central Bank. These were bonds that the ECB had purchased in 2011. Now, the main weapon I had was the threat that if you close down my banks to asphyxiate me, which is what they did, I will immediately restructure these 27 billion which were payable in the next two years, I'm going to delay payment by 40 years. Now, why was this important? 27 billion is not that much money for the Central Bank of Europe, but legally it was a major, ma it was a nuclear weapon. The reason is this. The only reason why uh, the Euro survives today is quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. The fact that Draghi, since March 2015, has been printing anything between 60 and 80 billion a month, purchasing bonds and other kinds of debt. Now, you may recall that Jens Weidmann, the president of the Buddhist Bank, was adamant against QE and its precursor, the so-called OMT program. So much so that he personally, representing of course the Buddhist Bank, took the European Central Bank to the Constitutional Court of Germany in Karlsruhe and asked the constitutional judges to deem these bond purchases by the ECB legal and in violation of the German constitution. This is a very big charge. Jens Weidmann uh, submitted 121 pages of a deposition signed by himself against this. Now, of course, the judges did what the judges do in these circumstances. They decided not to decide because it's just too difficult for them <laughs> to make this decision. So they referred the matter to the European court. Uh, and the European courts asked, uh, you know, summoned Mr. Draghi, who appeared in front of them, the judges, and won the case against Weidmann and Buddhist Bank on the basis of a pledge. And the pledge was that he would not allow any restructuring of any of the bonds owned by the ACB. This is why restructuring the 27 billion that, of Greek bonds, which were written in Greek law, which, in other words, all he needed was a signature from me in order to restructure them unilaterally, that would have blown up the QE program that kept the Euro together. This was a nuclear weapon that we had. We, I never wanted to use any weapons against Europe. But if they closed down my banks, I think it was co completely legitimate to say that 27 billion, well, you can't have it. So that was one part of the And deterrent. in the end you were not allowed to use this weapon? Yes. But, the, but, but we had a, the only reason why I accepted the ministry was because we shook hands with Alexis Tsipras and the leading team of Syriza that it no, makes no sense for us, for us to get elected. This is going along with the, the gist of your question. Uh, just with good arguments and the, the power of persuasion, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. There's a whole wall of denial in the Eurogroup and in the Troika. But if you have the nuclear weapon as well, uh, the doomsday machine, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. uh, then they will come to the table. And I have, I have no doubt that they would have come to the table. Unfortunately, yeah, this is where disunity brings defeat. Our government was disunited and members of the team signal to Draghi, don't worry about Varoufakis, we're not going to let him haircut those, uh, those bonds. And from that moment onwards, defeat was uh, um, But before that, you were convinced that Draghi would never let this happen? I still am convinced he would he not let it happen if I was allowed to do that. It was only when Draghi realized that we were not united in government and I would have had the rug pulled from under my feet that he closed the bank, the banks.
So who is who's the bad guy in this story? Because you you are quite understanding. You get along with George Osborne, the British Prime Minister, Prime Minister, even Wolfgang Schäuble, who was portrayed in the media as your arch enemy. You know, towards the end of the book, you you get you get along, or sort of you have good discussions. Who's the bad guy? No one. No one. I I try to write this book uh, with um, a humanist perspective. Uh, if you, you know, when you watch an ancient Greek tragedy, Oedipus, who is the bad guy? There are no Wait. bad guys. But well, there are no bad guys. Everybody is doing, trying to do their best. But that's the, the whole structure of a tragedy. The game is set up in such a way that even though everybody is trying to do their best, in the end everybody is contributing to a disaster. So how so do you change? This was exactly how I tried to write this book. I have no doubt that Wolfgang Schäuble was trying to do his best. Christine Lagarde was trying to do her best. My prime minister was trying to do his best. But in the end, the game we play in Europe is bringing out the worst possible outcome for our people. And even powerful men like you know, Wolfgang Schäuble or women like Angela Merkel, in the end, they are caught in the trap of their own power and end up powerless. This is the stuff of true tragedy. So how do you change Europe from being the stuff of true tragedy to something else? By democratizing it. Democratizing. Uh, you see, democracy is not a luxury for the creditors. It's not something that's nice to have. The reason why democracy evolved, uh, never perfectly and nowhere perfectly, is because it's the only way of managing a crisis. You see, during the good times, you don't need democracy. You can have a cartel structure like Europe always did. Europe is a cartel, really, of heavy industry. That's how it started, remember? It was the economic community of coal and steel, like OPEC. Um, and then, then the other, other industries were co-opted, the, the agricultural sectors through common agricultural policy. So when you have the United States of America minding the global shop and ensuring that there is growth internationally, which, which is what was going on between 1945 and 2008, really, in the global economy, and then you can have an undemocratic European Union expanding and everybody is relatively dissatisfied and relatively happy at the same time. And the whole thing is, is sustainable. I mentioned OPEC. Mm -hmm. When is OPEC about to crash? When prices come down. Yeah. During the bad times, the cartels cannot handle the distribution of burdens and losses. Similarly, it is now, since the crisis began, that you can see that the European Union is desperately in need of more democracy because it cannot handle the distribution and redistribution of burdens. That's why we need democracy and transparency. It is absurd that the people out there do not know what uh, their representatives are saying on their behalf behind closed doors. And that's why you were secretly recording the Eurogroup meetings under the table with your cell phone? No. It, that's not why I was doing it. I was doing it for even better reasons than that. After my first Eurogroup, which lasted ten and a half hours, I l exited that Eurogroup meeting with a head that was spinning from fatigue, from confusion, from exhaustion. Now, I considered myself to be, and I was, a representative of the Greek people and the Greek government in there. The, the, the future of a nation depended on what was being said during that meeting, I was threatened by the president of the Eurogroup with bank closures on that meet in that, during that very, very first meeting. Now, I had a responsibility towards my prime minister, my cabinet, my parliament and the Greek people to come out and answer questions as to what was said in there. And I remember once the press conference was finished, I asked my secretary for a copy of, uh, of the transcripts of the minutes. And she called me 10 minutes later saying, uh, Minister, I asked the Secretariat and there are no minutes. So it was for your own memory? Of course it was for my own memory. I had a duty to be able to report to Parliament. Parliament parliamentarians would ask me, you know, this is what happens in democracy. They said to you, so, so what did Schäuble say to you when you said that? And what exactly, what was the precise wording of what you said to Schäuble when it is a question of national survival? for a place like Greece. And I had no idea. I would have to say, you know what, I can't really remember. I have a hazy recollection because I was tired. So after that, I started recording. And then, and then, once the Brussels correspondence began to spread huge lies about what was said to me, about what I said in meetings, recording my conversations was the only defense against this kind of toxic lies.